The 508 is good enough to change the way we think about Peugeot's larger models. Comfortable and good to drive, it's a car that medium range Mondeo sector rivals will have to take very seriously indeed. Medium sized Mondeo class family cars tend to fall into one of three categories. First, there are those that are really sharp to drive. Ford's Mondeo itself is one of these, as is its cousin, the Mazda 6. At the other end of the spectrum, you have those that prioritize comfort above all else. Renault's Laguna springs to mind here, as does the Citroen C5. And that leaves in the middle those that can't quite make up their mind which priority to plump for. Cars like Volkswagen's Passat and Honda's Accord uh, fall into this category but are generally forgiven because they've more premium badges with a more premium feel. But if you haven't got that to fall back on, then things can be more difficult, which is why products like Toyota's Avensis, Seat's Exio, and even Vauxhall's Insignia are struggling here. Peugeot used to struggle with them, at least when it was trying to sell us the rather awkwardly styled 407. But it doesn't struggle anymore, thanks to this car, the 508. Now, if any manufacturer was going to get the blend of sharp sportiness and soft suppleness right in a car that any family or photocopier rep would be proud to own, then you bet on Peugeot to do it. Its recent efforts in this segment have, after all, varied from the 405 model of the 80s, the enthusiast choice, to the soft and syrupy 407 that this car must replace. What was needed was something able to combine the best of both and a car good enough not only to please Mondeo folk, but one also suffused with so much comfort and quality that its plusher versions could even think of stealing sales from the executive sector in which Peugeot used to campaign with the other model that this car must replace, their old 607. In order to do that, uh, a design was needed that would be slightly bigger and much more sophisticated. A design like this 508? Well, let's find out. Now, there are plenty of reasons why this 508 shouldn't be as good to drive as it is. It's bigger, so theoretically less agile than its predecessor for a start, and at as much as 1.7 tonnes, also pretty heavy for a car of this class. And if you are really going to produce a medium range model with handling to match a Mondeo, would you really base it on the waterbed-like Citroen C5, as in this case? All of which makes it even more surprising to find, once you do start to hustle this Peugeot along a bit, that it's up for the chase. If not quite the drive of your life, promised by the TV ads, then certainly a drive you'd really rather look forward to. Perhaps I should have expected this. After all, the clues were in the spec sheet. Take, for example, the brave decision to go against the grain and retain uh, hydraulic rather than electric power steering assistance for greater steering feel and greater feedback through the bends. That's incidentally why this car can't be ordered with the kind of self-parking systems that some rivals offer. Then there's Peugeot's provision of two distinct types of front suspension system. Not something you'd bother to do if all you cared your car to be able to offer was motorway mile munching. Uh, the bulk of the uh, 508 range gets a conventional struts uh, front suspension setup, but the flagship 204 PS 2.2 litre diesel has the double wishbone type uh, front suspension that was seen in the old 407 range. That's to handle its extra power. With GT badging, 0 to 60 mile an hour capability of 8.2 seconds and copious torque, this, the grandest uh, variant, really ought to offer the sportiest drive. But it doesn't. The non-negotiable provision of a six-speed automatic gearbox that does without the latest slick shifting double clutch electronics uh, is one explanation for this, but the main reason why is weight. Even though uh, it's lighter than the 407 V6 diesel it replaces, this top 508 uh, still has a big engine and uh, a fancy front suspension that adds 385 pounds to the weight of the car over an equivalent 2 litre HDI 508 diesel. My preference among these being for the lower powered 140 PS variant, uh, thanks to the fact that uh, you can order it with a lovely uh, short shifting, uh, slick shifting six speed manual gearbox denied to customers of the 163 PS variant. So less is more 
in 508 land then? Pretty much, yes. A sentiment which also applies when considering the 112 PS 1.6 litre HDI diesel. Now, one variant of this um, comes with the PSA Group's much heralded eHDI technology, which brings very welcome uh, efficiency savings, but ones that must be garnered in concert with a rather jerky semi-automatic EGC gearbox that Peugeot also insists that buyers of the entry-level petrol 1.6 litre 120 PS VTI model must have. And it's for that reason that if your budget, or more likely the budget of your company, restricts you to going for an entry-level 508, that I'd counsel you to buy a 112 PS 1.6 litre HDI model with a manual gearbox. Or, and this is, I admit, a rather left field choice, go for the 156 PS 1.6 litre petrol turbo model. Now, though its 8.6 second 0 to 60 mile an hour capability might cost you a little on your BIK tax paperwork, the showing is no worse here or at the pumps than it would be if you'd opted for the 2 litre HDI 163 PS automatic 508 model, and that's a poorer performing car. If though issues of personal taxation and eco-friendliness are high upon your agenda, then you might be better off asking your dealer about the 200 PS diesel electric hybrid four powertrain also developed by the 508 design team. So how to sum up? Well, Ford hasn't been surpassed as the driver's choice in this sector, but Peugeot has run the blue oval close with a more refined car that's a more relaxing haven over longer journeys. There's a quality here that feels premium German, and I'm not just talking about the fixtures or the fittings. The acoustic windscreen, the dampers fitted to the front axle to reduce vibration, and the suspension setup that even in its simplest form rides potholes with disdainful ease and enables confident cornering. It all adds up to the most impressive medium range sector car that Peugeot has bought us over the last 20 years. Now, if you're wondering why Peugeot's historical model progression with this class of car from 405 to 406 and 407 hasn't resulted in uh, them providing us with something badged 408, then it's because the French brand wants to make a completely fresh start here. And that includes the styling. Gone is the gaping front end we've seen on most of the brand's modern era designs. A styling device, we were told at the time, but a look it now appears was created only because the stylists couldn't find a more aesthetically pleasing way around front end passenger legislation. All this time they could have been bringing us something with the sleek, simple and elegant lines of this 508. The front end, produced by Gilles Vidal and his design team, is especially nice. The sweeping lines of the aluminium crafted bonnet flowing down to a proud lion badge, which close inspection reveals is sitting just above a subtle Peugeot script. More cleverness can be found inside. Let's start here at the back. The need for lower CO2 figures and better fuel returns meant that this car needed to be lighter and less substantial than its predecessor. Yet the need also to replace Peugeot's executive sized 607 as well as their 407 Mondeo class model meant that this car had to be bigger. Well, it is lighter, uh, over 45 kilograms lighter in the case of this SW estate model. And yes, it is bigger too, over 10 centimeters longer than the old 407, nearly all of which has gone into a longer wheelbase, which has rewarded rear seat passengers with over five centimeters of extra knee room at the back. It all feels especially airy in this SW estate model, thanks to a full length 1.62 meter panoramic glass sunroof that's 25% bigger than that fitted to the previous model. Now, though there isn't quite the cabin width to accommodate three adults on long journeys, as you'd find in, say, Ford Mondeo, the provision of an almost flat floor for the centre um, rear passenger should alleviate most complaints. And on plusher versions, uh, backseat occupants can enjoy luxurious touches like uh, reading lights and their own individual aircon controls. 
Out back, thanks again to that lengthy wheelbase, this is a more spacious luggage carrier than the old 407 ever was. The saloon version's boot able to accommodate 473 litres, a figure you can boost if you opt for this SW Estate model to 512 litres. And you can increase that again, of course, if you flatten the 60-40 split folding rear seats using these helpful levers at either sides of the estate bay. Though because the seat backs merely flop onto the seat bases, the resulting two meter long load length isn't completely flat. Good though that there are practical touches, this loading net and some fixed hooks for restraining straps so that you can keep your eggs from merging with your iron brew. Now on some models you also get a very useful 48 litre under boot floor compartment. You push back this concertina carpeted boot floor and it would be here, except that in this case I filled it with a full size spare wheel. But were the compartment to be in place, it's very easy to segment your boot area into lots of different spaces before pulling back the boot floor to keep valuables safe away from prying eyes. Even if a thief should break into your vehicle, it might well be the work of more than a few moments to locate your gear, given the sheer number of cubbies and compartments dotted around the cabin. You've got 22 litres of space in all, and the usual cup holders just above the stereo system on the dash. But it isn't the practicality you remember after a spell at the wheel. Quality is the overriding theme here, with a centre console stylishly lacquered in black with chrome-tipped highlights. You've also got a driver's seat that adjusts to every contour of your body, and a standard of fit and finish that's on a par not only with the best of this car's mainstream rivals, but also with compact executive cars from German premium brands. Depending on the deal that you get and the spec and model that you choose, it's likely that you'll find yourself paying somewhere between 18 and a half and 30,000 pounds for your 508, with a premium of around 1,000 pounds to go from the four-door saloon to the five-door SW Estate variant that I've got here. The body shape that Peugeot reckons will account for most retail sales in the absence of the kind of five-door hatchback body style that competitors offer. Now, direct comparisons with rivals are a little difficult due to Peugeot's insistence on equipping some entry-level petrol and diesel models with an EGC semi-automatic gearbox that not all buyers will want. At least in the case of the popular 1.6-litre HDI 112 diesel variant, you can save yourself £800 by doing without it. And this entry-level diesel point for 508 ownership will save you a few hundred pounds over an equivalent Ford Mondeo or Renault Laguna. The 508 engine range has been carefully chosen across the various four-door saloon and five-door SW Estate body styles, with a little more petrol choice than was offered by the old 407 lineup in its latter years. That petrol selection varies between an entry level 120 PS 1.6 litre VTI power plant or a turbocharged version of that unit, the THP 1.6 with 156 PS. But most business buyers will be wanting diesel. Uh, possibly the 112 PS 1.6 litre HDI with or without eco-centric EGC semi-automatic transmission, but more likely the uh, 2 litre 140 PS HDI power plant. If you want a bit more grunt than that, then you're looking at an automatic only choice between a 163 PS 2 litre HDI or the flagship 204 PS 2.2 litre HDI unit and uh, that particular latter more powerful engine comes with double wishbone front suspension to handle all that extra grunt. More eco-centric buyers will be interested to know that the clever French engineers have also developed a hybrid 4 system, an engine with 200 PS and what effectively amounts to four-wheel drive with an HDI diesel at the front and an electric motor driving at the rear. All 508s come with the kind of kit list that you'd expect to find on a modern Mondeo rival. 
So all variants come with things like air conditioning, daytime running lights, a decent quality MP3 compatible CD stereo with USB connectivity, power windows and mirrors, remote central locking and hill assist to help you get away easily on uphill junctions. Plusher models include a rather fiddly electronic parking brake and luxurious four zone climate control. But you'll be wanting to know about the really high tech stuff. After all, a lot of recently launched modern cars offer a real feast of it. And though this 508 does lag behind a few of its rivals in some areas, so there's no collision mitigation braking system for the avoidance of pedestrians or low speed accidents, no self parking system, no radar guided cruise control to help you maintain a safe motorway distance to the car in front. Uh, the Peugeot does try and make up uh, for this in other areas, but as usual, most such features are limited either to the options list or to plusher variants. Into this category fall things like a high beam assistant that dips your headlamps for you at night, a heads up display that projects driving information onto the lower part of the windscreen in front of you so that you don't have to take your eyes off the road. There's uh, a Wi-Fi on board unit so that anyone can get online in car. There are um, directional headlamp beams that follow you around corners and you can even get a massaging front seat just like your company CEO has in his limo. Safety wise, there are twin front side and curtain airbags, plus a whole host of electronic acronyms to try and ensure that you never have to use them. There are ABS brakes, of course, and EBFD, electronic brake force distribution to make them more effective, plus EBA, emergency braking assistance to help in violent stops. You get ESP stability control naturally and ASR traction control. Should the worst happen, there's the option of the Peugeot Connect SOS emergency system, able in an accident to pinpoint your exact location and dispatch the emergency services. Now an easy way to proclaim this 508 a class leader in this respect is to talk about the diesel electric hybrid 4 model with its CO2 emissions return of just 99 grams per kilometre. But here we're going to focus on the more conventional petrol and diesel uh, variants that most customers would actually buy. Now most will be drawn to diesel power with the most eco-friendly and cleanest uh, example of this being the 109 grams per kilometre, 112 PS, 1.6 litre EHDI model, which comes with an EGC semi-automatic gearbox and a clever start-stop technology that uh, kills the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck at the lights or when you're waiting in urban traffic. Now you can have this same engine uh, with a conventional five-speed manual gearbox, but if you do, then the CO2 figure falls from 109 right down to 124 grams per kilometre. As for petrol power, well, the cleanest example of that can be found with the 120 PS 1.6 litre VTI, which returns 144 grams per kilometre. Though if you order the substantially more powerful 156 PS 1.6 litre THP petrol turbo, uh, that greater performance isn't going to cost you very much. Uh, the CO2 figure rises only slightly to 149 grams per kilometre. Uh, Green-fingered eco-warriors will be pleased to know that 85% of this Peugeot 508 is recyclable and 95% of it is degradable. Now, if you haven't tried any of the new generation of medium range models in this sector of the market, then you'll find the fuel consumption figures of this one to be scarcely believable for such a large car. Best of the bunch when it comes to the conventional petrol and diesel range is predictably the 1.6 litre EHDI variant, which manages 64.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle. But not far behind is the 140 PS uh, 2 litre HDI diesel, which manages 58.9 miles to the gallon. Even the 156 PS 1.6 litre THP petrol turbo manages over 44 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle. Uh, what else? Uh, residual values should be higher than those of the old 407 because less discounting is promised by Peugeot. Insurance costs might be slightly higher than the competition, but lengthy service intervals every 20,000 miles will be more than welcome. Every maker in this sector 
presents its car as appealing to young, independent, stylish individuals with active lifestyles and so on, which is rubbish, of course. People of that sort will be more likely to buy a sports coupe or a SUV. But buyers of that kind who have to have a medium-sized Mondeo-class family car will be more than happy with this 508, and it's been a long time since we could have said that about a Peugeot of this sort. I'm struggling to think of another car in this segment that better blends enjoyable handling and luxurious comfort. Which means we have a contender here well able to thrust this Gallic brand back into contention in this part of the market. Indeed, it's even a car that might interest lower order BMW and Audi customers in the unlikely event that they're prepared to put aside badge prejudice and try one. The bottom line is that business and family buyers need to return Peugeot to their choice lists, and not before time. <laughs>